So one of the major things Teen Angels and Tween Angels are working on right now is the Megan Pledge. Many of you have heard the story of Megan Meyer, who committed suicide after being cyberbullied on MySpace. Our chapter learned about this story and then decided we wanted to do something to spread Megan's story and to get other kids to educate themselves about cyberbullying and to educate their friends. So we created a Megan Pledge, which gives kids tips on how to avoid cyberbullying, and we have, it has been signed 450,000 times this year. We want a million by the end of the year, so hopefully we'll get some more help. Teen Angels also plays a prominent role in advising the industry. So um, people like, uh, companies like Procter & Gamble um, and MySpace and Facebook come to us to get advice about how to make their, um, their internet, um, like MySpace and, and Facebook, their social networking, how to make their site safer. Procter & Gamble, I'm one of the consultants for their site called Being Girl, and we give uh, safety tips to the girls who go on there. Kids used to do bake sales. I signed a $45,000 consulting gig with the girls to help moderate Procter & Gamble's site to fund their Megan Pledge program. Um, another major activity for us is speaking. Um, we speak to um, not, not only in groups like this, but also to students our age and younger, and their parents. One of our first, um, one of our first speaking jobs was to a school, an entire middle school. Um, and um, we tell them about cyberbullying, and that's where we begin a lot of our research, because we do take surveys during the course of our, of our presentations. And that gives us basis for what kids will respond to when we <laughs> actually do paper surveys and collect the numbers. Um, I'd also like to add that we found through our research and the, with the fact that we're teens, so teens will tell us the truth more often than they'll tell um, adults or when their parents are around. And one of the things we found is that the issue isn't so much sexual predators, but the issue is more, it's coming from them, it's cyberbullying. Um, and do you want to explain what it? Okay. So here are some of the stats we found that were very interesting. 70% of the kids we surveyed had given out their passwords to their friends. And so when you analyze the risks online, you have to take into account that they're not always, it's not always adults putting children at risk. A lot of the times it's kids putting their friends and their classmates at risk because they know about these kids and they have information that can do a lot of damage if it's used improperly. You may want to just run through them yourself. Okay. So we also found that most underage users, so under 13, go to Zanga or MySpace or some other network that can be customized before switching over to Facebook about eighth or ninth grade. Um, Almost 46% are sharing IM or other contact info on their profiles. 85% felt that Facebook is safer than MySpace or than other networks. 54% of people said they have people on their friends list they don't actually know. 65% said they don't really understand privacy settings. 40% put their cell phone numbers either on their profiles or away messages linked to their profiles. Only 15% said they knew how to shut down a profile. Only 5% said they would bother reporting anything to the social networking site. 45% said they didn't think it would make a difference if they did. And only 2% knew how to. Now they do extensive research as part of getting their wings. They have to do two independent research projects. Okay, you may have um, to make your well. Sure, I'm sorry. Uh, Teen Angels is part of getting their wings to qualify. It takes them about a year or two to finish their training program. They have to do independent research. And the research projects have to have at least 500 kids in them, and we oversee them in an academic manner. If you want to keep this separate. Then you can oh, thank you so much. Um, these are some of the things that people put on their uh, profiles on their uh, mostly Facebook is what we found. Um, I'll just run down the list. Uh, full name, address, telephone number, email, cell phone number, workplace, schedule at school, weekend plans, I am screen name or aim, uh, friends info, location, school, pics of themselves and pictures of their friends, and links to other profiles. Um, we were surprised at how many put things like weekend plans because it made it so easy for someone to um, find them. 
um, wherever they are, um, even if they didn't have their location or their home address, they could say, oh, I'm going to be such and such a place, putting themselves at risk without really realizing it. Also, um, a lot of people had other profiles linked to, say they had a Facebook and a MySpace. Um, and that creates a bit of a problem if you have a MySpace with one set of friends that you want to see one thing and then a Facebook with another, because then you can get to both just by having the link to one and it just opens up um, how many people can contact you on each one. Um, just to add something to this, I did specific research on boys and girls social networking and one of the things we found about the information was that boys were a lot um, more likely to put more, more of this kind of information on their sites. So their behavior is a little bit more risky and the other thing we found was that while most teens know, I, oh, I shouldn't put my address on, I shouldn't, you know, give explicit ways um, for people to find me, they still put enough information for someone to be able to locate them and find out what school they go to and what teens they're on, and so someone would still be able to find them. A lot of teens are taking this into their own hands. There was a group of students in Maryland who, as a student council, pulled together an undercover operation where they went to Facebook and they found out what information was being shared and how many were doing it and gave the kids different color bracelets and a large assembly to out them. And then they went to a place of work where one of the girls, it's a student in the high school, had indicated what her work hours were. And it was California Pizza Kitchen. So they showed up with a video camera and sat in the car and stalked her. Um, somebody had noticed that somebody was stalking her. They actually followed her home, um, and she didn't tell the police at that point, but we had her do a narration over the video of her freaked while people were following her home, and the next morning when she told the school resource officer what had happened, um, they knew about the student council project and said, this was being used to show how easily someone could have found you. And then she became involved in the project and narrated it over. It's very, very interesting, and I'm happy to share it with you. Katie Couric actually had run something on it. OK, so um, I did a research project last year, and I surveyed 550 boys and girls through, um, from 9th through 12th grade. And it was a comparison study about the social networking habits of boys and girls. Um, and one of the interesting things that we found was that there a lot of boys and girls are friends with people they haven't met online, um, more than half. And also that although they wouldn't meet with them in person, most of them had spoken to them through I am. And, um, and, they, cell phones. and cell phones. My research project analyzed how friends cyberbully friends. And I picked that topic because friends are the people that know the most about you and they have the most information about you and they can do the most damage with that information. And what I found was that 70% of kids had shared their passwords with their friends. And also that kids that had reported being hurt online had said it was by their friends, people they knew, and people they had shared personal information with beforehand. Your friends have your secrets and your passwords. And the reason some surveys contradict each other is that kids don't always tell the real truth when they're giving answers to surveys. For example, if parents are watching or if parents might find out the answers to these questions, kids are more likely to hide the fact that they've been cyberbullied because they don't want their computers taken away, they don't want their parents to always be worrying about them, and they don't want to feel like crybabies. They think they can handle it by themselves. And that's why it's important for the teen angels to do research because they know that we're not going to out them or anything, and we are on the sites just like they are, and we understand where they're coming from. Um, another reason the surveys don't always reflect the real problem is that when kids are cyberbullied by their friends, they often feel the need to protect their friends. They don't want people to know they're having friendship problems or that their former best friend is now targeting them online. They feel embarrassed by that. And less than a quarter of the people that reported being cyberbullied, um, or less than a quarter of the people we surveyed, realized that they were being cyberbullied and actually told someone. And, but only 5% told their parents. But when we broke down what cyberbullying really is, many more, over 50% of the people had actually been cyberbullied. They just didn't realize 
how to define it or what it was. Yeah, and that's part of the problem on the surveys. We've seen them, and, and on our surveys, we pulled about 45,000 middle school kids in person, and about 85% of them have indicated they've been cyberbullied. But you can't say, have you been cyberbullied? To them, that means a death threat or somebody's posted a fake social network about you with sexual pictures or innuendos. Um, they don't realize that it's somebody stealing your password, changing things on your profile, and locking you out of it. And when you start going through those, some of them yesterday, um, you want to explain the one yesterday? I mean, these kids are very inventive. Whenever we do presentations, we always ask the kids, what do they think cyberbullying is, or how can they be cyberbullied? And one person yesterday actually said that one way of cyberbullying is to take someone's cell phone and reprogram a number so that their girlfriend or boyfriend's name is now your phone number so that you can text them and they think it's coming from their girlfriend or boyfriend. So stealing cell phones off of the table and sending threatening messages, pretending to be that kid and putting it back, is now a really new trend. We also made a list of about 20 questions that can be used to easily guess passwords. And among all the grades, the majority of passwords could be guessed. So not only are kids giving away their passwords, but they're making them easy enough for all their friends to figure out. So one thing we need to work on doing is having kids create passwords that aren't so difficult to remember so that they write them down, because that's dangerous in itself, but that aren't so easy as, so that they can be guessed. So do you want to explain the 20 questions, just a couple examples of what we do with 20 questions? OK. Um, some of those are your year of graduation, your favorite color, where you want to go to college, or where you were born. And we, we analyzed a lot of different passwords. We did surveys. And a group of teenagers put together a list of the 20 most common ways to guess a password. And that's where the statistic came from. And we just finished the training for all of the Girl Scouts of the United States. And that will be made public in a few months on cyber safety. And they've come up with a concept called designer passwords, taking two words that make spe special sense to you and putting them together. Um, so if you like eating Twizzlers at movies, Clueless, which is your favorite movie, and if you're at Facebook, so Clueless FB Twizzlers is now your, your password. Something you'll remember, customize site by site, and won't have to put in the asterisks and uppercase and stuff and reinvent it every day. Okay, so what do you... What do you want to tell these guys? What do you need them to know? What, do you, what help do you need? OK, so obviously, um, the, the start of safety comes with the teens themselves. So as teen angels, we have the opportunity to teach teens and get them to start being aware of um, the danger they put themselves in online. But we also need help at the industry level and the uh, technology level. Um, so we need, for example, on Facebook, when someone friends you, maybe a reminder that when you say, yes, this person is my friend, they'll be able to see everything that you have on your profile. Um, maybe make the terms of service and the safety a little bit more interesting or informative um, so that unlike most teens will look at it, press I agree, and skim right over it because, I mean, it, it's boring legal stuff. That's how it's presented. But maybe if there was a way um, to make it more interesting, more people would read it and more people would know how to keep themselves safer. Right, and like Stephanie said, the biggest problem is that kids don't know how to use the sites properly. They don't know how to be safe online. So maybe when you post pictures, have a reminder that says, um, don't post pictures of you wearing your school uniform because people will be able to know where you go to school. Don't post pictures of you in your soccer uniform because people will know where you are on the weekends or where you go to play soccer. Or friends without their permission. Right. Don't post pictures of your friends without talking to them first and getting their permission. So it's things like that. It's the little things that are very easy to overlook, but that can be very dangerous. One thing we discussed earlier was um, confirming a, f a tagged photo of you. Um, a lot of the time, people tag photos of you, and you can't have the option to take it down, which, um, which has been a problem in some of the people we've surveyed, I think. And um, having, a, having a way to get rid of a picture you don't want online, you don't want out there, um, or you don't want distrib distributed to your friends, um, that would be a good start for um, keeping yourself safe online. Also, um, 
it making it less easy to contact um, people you don't know, or um, what Perry called a do not disturb button on, um, on websites. If you don't want to be contacted by someone, you can press that button. Uh, make it easier for, your, for yourself to be less reachable. Um, also, we don't think that the issue is so much age verification that there's a magic age where once you pass it, you're going to be safe online and you're going to really know what you're doing. It's more of an identity uh, verification. If kids know that the site knows who they are, they're, they're more likely to um, want to behave better online. Right. If kids think that somehow if they do something wrong, Facebook or MySpace will be able to target them and shut down their profile and know that it was them that did it, they are much less likely to do something unsafe or to do something that involves cyberbullying. I know we need to go and you're tight on time. A couple things. A, the kids do consulting on cyberbullying proof technologies. So Chris is very good. I know you're great about calling us. MySpace did it in 2005. I think we need to start again. Tell us new technologies you want to launch before you do it, as early as you give it to us. I'll tell you how the kids are going to break it. So you can put those things in. Use tutorials that are kid-oriented. Take your terms of service and your privacy policies. If you want them to follow your rules, you have to do it in a way that kids understand it. Make it fun, do animations. Use serious gaming to teach kids what they need to know. Um, get out there on the Megan Pledge. It's not a MySpace issue, and you know we keep saying this kid, this happened on MySpace. It could have happened absolutely anywhere. Um, we need to get out there and have the kids own the issue that this is unacceptable, and we're going to stand up for other people, so it's not going to happen. Um, the stuff's out there. These kids work for free, um, except when Procter and Gamble calls. Um, <laughs> but you know they, they're they're experts. I have many of them, girls and boys, all different sizes, shapes, colors, in countries around the world. We just set up two in Pakistan. Um, it's in a unique program where the kids become the experts and care about these issues. Now they their new issue is they want to create a teen helpline, where teen angels and specially trained other teens will be able to respond to requests for by young people anywhere from the sites with a hot button from others where they can come saying, I'm being cyberbullied, this happened, I don't know what to do. It'll be modeled off of the kids' helpline that's in Canada that's a phone service. This will be done through IM and text. We're going to need help making that happen. And I think if we can do that, the kids have also said they want a helpline for troubled parents. I think that means sort of all of us these days. Um, not on, I want my kid off of Facebook, but my kids have been cyberbullied and I don't know what to do. And that would be manned by our volunteers at Wired Safety and the teens, depending upon the issue. So this stuff's there. Talk to them about it on the technologies. They know what they're doing. They'll break it if you don't do it right. And if you don't do it right, they won't come back. So you want to keep them as customers. You want them to obey the rules. You want them to understand this. They're very happy to have you know who they are. They are very happy to keep adults out of where they are. They are not there to be with the adults. They're there to talk to other kids. Um, so what you need to do is recognize what they really want, what they're willing to do, and what they won't put up with. Thanks. Perry, thank you so much. Thanks to your team.